Hello. Uh, this is going to be the fourth installment of what I'm calling nationalistic chain reactions in Europe, 1815 to 1914. Um, it's an interesting story. It really does affect us today. I can't go on forever and ever, but I'll try to talk about it. Uh, here's a, a book showing the they call it the uh, ethnic groups of Europe. Back in the 1800s, you see. And we're going to focus on the Balkan Peninsula, which is an area that still has terrible ethnic problems and, in fact, suffered from <clears throat> ethnic wars in the 1990s, wars which were stopped by the group in the 2000s wars which were stopped by the intervention of the great powers or you might could say the interference of the great powers but um to give you a, a little rundown or background to it um we have to go back to the roman empire all right so we look at the Roman Empire, and we know how big that was, stretching from um, Persia, the border with Persia, Iran, all the way to Spain, north to into Germany, south along the um, Saharan Desert. Now, the Roman Empire in the west collapsed by the year AD 476, it was gone. Um, the eastern part continued on. It was the stronger half, and um, it stayed very strong until the rise of Islam in 622. The Arabs, the Islamic Arabs, started to make their great invasion, and it, the empire had trouble standing up to it. They did beat it back, and then... Um, an Asiatic group called the Turks, who were pushed into Southwest Asia by the Mongols. They came, and the Mongols did take over for a little while too. They came pouring in, first the Seljuk Turks and then the Ottoman Turks. They adopted Islam, they were Muslims, and um, they started to batter at the Eastern Roman Empire. And the Eastern Roman Empire, like just like the Persian Empire wasted a lot of its energy fighting the Persians, the Persians wasted a lot of their en en energy fighting the Eastern Romans along that Tigris-Euphrates border area, similar to Iran and Iraq fighting each other in the 1980s. But um, after the Battle of Manzikirk in um, 1071, the Eastern Empire started to decline and they called for help in the Western countries came in with the Crusades and they helped them to an extent, but there was a schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics. And so there was a lot of animosity between them and the, the uh, French and the Germans and the English spent a lot of their time conspiring, especially with the Venetians of Italy, who were in a rivalry, a trade rivalry with the Eastern Romans, the Byzantines, modern historians call it the Byzantine Empire, but back then no one called it that name fighting over trade. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, incidences, and we're not going to go into all of that, that weakened the Eastern Empire. And then when the Ottoman Turks came in in the 1300s, they began to batter against the Eastern Empire. And by the year 1453, they destroyed it. And that was it. That was the last remnant of the original Roman Empire established in the ancient days. So the Ottoman Turks came in. They booted the Serbians. The Serbians had their own empire too at one time, but they booted them out the way and they surged into the Balkan Peninsula, into Greece, conquering Greece, conquering down at the bottom of the Mediterranean, Egypt, eventually conquering the island of Cyprus. This is the shock top pumpkin beer. It's pretty good if you like pumpkin beers. I don't really care for it, that kind of stuff. But um, so the Ottoman Empire became very big but like most of these empires, they're never satisfied to, right, to be a certain size. They want to keep getting bigger and bigger. They spent a lot of their energy fighting the um, Persians, 
that weakened them. Then they decided they wanted to conquer Europe. They made a great invasion in 1571, which failed when the combined Roman Catholic, Spanish, Italian, and other forces defeated them at the Battle of Lepanto, a naval battle. <clears throat> they came close to taking over the ancient German city of Vienna in the 1500s. They made a second invasion in the 1680s, almost taking over Vienna again. 1689 was their last big attack, but with the help of the Polish armies, other German armies and Spanish armies, they pushed the Ottomans back. So really after 1689, the Ottoman Empire began to decline, this Muslim Turkish Empire. Now, and at the same time, the Russian Empire north of them was on the rise. And so naturally, the Russians and the Ottomans bordering each other around the Caspian and Black Sea, they're going to have a number of wars. The Russians usually win in the wars and slowly pushing the Turks back. So we're talking all through this late 1600s, throughout the 1700s, and now into the 1800s. <clears throat> okay, Russia was distracted because of the great Napoleonic invasion of 1812. So there was a lot of rigmarole with that, right? The French Revolution and Napoleon <clears throat> Bonaparte rises and he tries to take over Europe. The Russians refused to cooperate with him because um, they didn't really care who won between Napoleon and the British, but it was hurting their business, their commerce, and so they told Napoleon, we're not going to be part of your system. And so he made his big last ditch invasion of Russia to try to bring them in line, which was a total failure for him. And uh, then three years later, after his final uprising, he was defeated at Waterloo, okay, and so booted out of Europe, died on the prison island of St. Helena, or in prison on the island of St. Helena, which is still today a British colony. All right. In the previous videos, we talked about how Russia and Scandinavian countries developed, talked about Great Britain and Ireland, uh, the low countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, talked about Spain and Portugal, which wasn't too complicated because they were already pretty much developed, and France also, except for political problems, not ethnic problems so much. And then we talked about the complicated situation with Germany, which had a common ethnicity, Germanic, did not have a common religion since the Protestant Catholic split of the 1500s. But Germany had a lot of complicated political issues, which were partially settled in 1871 with the establishment of the Second Reich, the second empire nation of, you know, the Hohenzollern, it's the German empire. Okay. Austria, a German state, Österreich, mean Eastern empire country created their own empire, mainly ruling over non-Germanic peoples, the, the Bohemians in Bohemia, today Czechia, Czech Republic, the Slovaks, eventually into Poland, Ukraine, Romanians, Slovenians, um, Italians, and all these different groups. So the Austrians had this multicultural empire, which, and, oh, excuse me, the Hungarians, it was very hard for them to keep that empire together because of all the ethnic problems, language problems. So they tried to unite it with, well, they couldn't really use, you know, they, you know, they were Catholic, but that wasn't so successful and they couldn't use language, but they tried to use the idea of the royal family, the Habsburgs. But with the rise of nationalism in Europe throughout the 1800s, that's going to be not so strong of a glue to hold the empire together. But it will be held together up into 1914, even with all the internal issues. So we go to the Balkans. <clears throat> okay. In the year 1815, the Balkan Peninsula was occupied by the Turks. So you had Italy, which was all divided up, and you know I did a video on that. Italy divided up between the different um, countries, and then Italy getting united becoming united in 1860, eventually fully united in 1870. North Italy had the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, that was formed out of the Austrian Empire in 1867. But below that is the Ottoman Empire. All the way down to Egypt, stretching all the way to Persia and to the Persian Gulf and up to the Russian border around the Black Sea. So it's a huge empire and out to Libya, we call it Libya today, they call it Tripoli back then, the island of 
Cyprus and all the Greek islands. Huge empire, but weak. Had a lot of internal problems, the uh, Ottoman Empire. Now, the, uh, b before I get into that, they did try to focus, now of course they were Islamic, and so they punished non-Islamics by making them pay a penalty tax, uh, and they, they were, you know, they mistreated the um, Christians and Jews and other groups. Okay. But the Ottomans didn't want to see their empire bust apart because of ethnic reasons. So they, they never called their empire the Turkish Empire, even though it was controlled by the Turks, the, the tribe of people called the Turks. They called it the Ottoman Empire, named after their founder, Osman, and they tried to make it a multicultural empire. They would promote the, the best people, or maybe the, the people willing to pay the most bribe money. But they had many Jews and Catholic, uh, some Catholics, uh, mostly Eastern Orthodox Christians working through all, all throughout the empire. So if you cooperated with them, you could have a pretty decent life and a career, even if you weren't Muslim. Similar to the Roman Empire, they didn't really care if you worshiped the Roman gods, as long as you paid taxes and you could rise up pretty high in the Roman Empire. Okay, so, but the, the Ottoman Empire was very weak, or relatively weak in 1815. Now, as far as the Napoleonic Wars were concerned, they could give a flip who won between the French and the British and the Russians. They didn't really care. They just wanted to be left alone and have their empire intact and not intact and not be attacked. Intact and not be attacked. Okay. <clears throat> but remember the rise of nationalism, this idea that all the nations, meaning tribes of people, ethnic groups, that's what a nation is, will have their own uh, self-government, their own country. Which in the case of England wouldn't be a problem, but it would be a problem for the English because of the fact that they ruled over the Irish. So there's a problem there. Not so much with the Scottish, although there was an election in 2015, right, which failed. It was a proposal to break away from England, Great Britain. France didn't really have an ethnic problem because it's all French. But a multicultural country like the Ottoman Empire is going to lead to real bad problems if these ethnic groups start to rise up. If, it, if the Arabs in the southeast rise up, or the Armenians in the northeast, or it's other pro-Russian ethnic groups, or the Egyptians in the European groups rise up, it's a real problem. They didn't have a problem with Jews rising up because um, they're scattered all throughout the empire. They weren't really concentrated in an area large enough to have their own country at the time. So there wasn't really the Zionist movement, this idea to recreate Israel. They had Jews living in um, Judea and all that, but um, that wasn't really a problem for them. The first big ethnic group to rise up were the Greeks. Greeks decided we want independence. Now, the Turks were semi-civilized, okay? I mean, but they're still Turks and they're still from Asia and they're still, they were still past masters of extreme brutality and their Islamic faith did not seem to impede their, their relish for murder, mass murder. So in 1830, in the 1830s, the Greeks decided to rise, uh, 1820s, excuse me, the 1820s, the Greeks decided to rise up. And so the Turks decided they will go massacre as many Greeks as they could. So they go pouring into Greece, and the Turks are already in Greece, and they did what they were so good at doing, raping all the women, murdering all the babies, shooting all the men, and just generally committing mayhem. At first, the European leaders leadership seemed indifferent to it. I know my trouble with the Turks is like, oh, well, those Greeks shouldn't have risen up. It just seemed like they were, they didn't care. But there was a lot of uh, what you would call, we would call today activism by European intellectuals. We got to help these people. And Russia saw themselves, the Romanovs, the Tsars, the Eastern Orthodox Russians, saw themselves as the protectors of the Greek people because the Russian culture was largely imported from the old Byzantine Eastern Roman Greek Empire. So Russia decided they're going to. They started to rattle their sabers and say, we're gonna, don't make us come blowing through here. And that's when the British and the French decided, well, especially the British, we will intervene. 
not that they were so concerned about all these Christians being massacred, but they were concerned about hegemony, the Russians establishing a super empire in the East. And heck, if anybody was going to establish a super empire, it was going to be one established and headquartered in London. We're going to notice this theme throughout the 18 and 1900s. Only one country is going to have a big empire, and that's going to be the British. And if any other country tries to establish one, there's going to be trouble, unless it's the Americans, because they seem to be, if you notice the, the story carefully, they seem to be joined at the hip with the British, which begs the question, why even break away in the first place if you're going to work in concert for the rest of history? But um, so that the great powers intervened, and they, they made the Turks back down, and so... <clears throat> In the 1830s, a new little country is created, Greece. They have no king, so they import <laughs> a German to be the <coughs> king of the Greeks, interestingly. A German family. They had to find the right royal connection. But the Greeks were happy. In fact, talking about Greeks, Queen Elizabeth of England today is married to Prince Philip of Greece. Yeah, that's right. A Greek royal family member, if you want to, if you want to say Greek, but really German, right? That uh, you know, it's German, but Battenburg and all of that. But anyway, um, so it starts a chain reaction. The Greeks get independence. Hey. Well, you know what's going to happen? The Serbs and the Montenegrins, who basically were self-governing anyway. The Turks had trouble getting up into those mountains and bringing those Montenegrins under, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, Montenegrins under their control, the Slovenians, uh, the Romanians, the Bulgarians all say, well, hey, we want our independence. So there's, a, there's other outbreaks of war throughout the 1830s and 40s and 50s between Russia and Turkey. Serious outbreak, and, and, and it's such a com complicated story involving Louis Napoleon of France, Napoleon III, the holy sites in Palestine, a war between the Catholics and the Druze tribes in Lebanon, and all this intervention in Syria and Lebanon and Palestine. Sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? But we can't go into all that. But suffice to say, in 1853, another war broke out between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And Russia was just smashing them, right? Who do you think comes to the rescue of the Muslim Turkish Empire? You guessed right. The British show up and tell Russia, stop picking on those poor Turks. Now the Tsar says, what are you talking about? The poor Turks. You mean these enslavers of Christians? These mass murderers? We're not going to stop picking on them. So the British intervene along with Louis Napoleon of France and the war breaks out and it's fought mainly on the Crimean Peninsula where we just had a recent war right remember that where Russia invaded and re-annexed Crimea from Ukraine in 2014 but they're fighting out there on the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea so you have the Turks the British the French versus the Russians and that war drug on from 53 to 56 and it was a very um, poorly run war from both sides militarily. You had a bunch of old leftover generals from years ago that should have been retired and naval commanders. So it ended up being a stalemate and it was sort of a scandal in Great Britain. A lot of people lost their jobs behind that one. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and then at the end of the war, Sardinia joined in the, the kingdom of Sardinia of Italy, not because they cared anything about it, but they wanted to get their name in there and get involved because so, they had a project they were looking to work on, and their project was called Create the Kingdom of Italy Under Control of Sardinia. All right, well, anyway. So in 1856, the British and the French and the Russians called off, and the Turks called the war off, and they basically just say status quo, antebellum. We're going to bring the, the borders back to where they were before the war and just call it a washout. Okay, fine. End of the story, no, the beginning of the story. <clears throat> 1877, okay, and, and there's a lot of other uprisings. I know some viewers are gonna say, yeah, but you forgot about all the, I didn't forget, I cannot talk about it all. The video would last hours and hours and hours. So we're only touching the highlights. 1877, 
huge uprising breaks out in the Balkans with the Serbians, the Montenegrins, the Bulgarians rising up against the Turks. I'm not saying it should have risen up against the Turks. This is not about what I think. They had lived under the Turks for hundreds of years, but this is this nationalism thing, right? So I'm not paying that penalty. Now, the Turks were supposed to not make them pay this tax anymore. There was That was an agreement with the with great powers. Okay, they don't have to pay the jizya anymore, the, the penalty tax for not being a Muslim. But the Turks really didn't play fair, and they kept repressing the Christians. And they, There was all kind of badness going on, you know. But um, so the Bulgarians and them tried to rise up. Well, predictably, the Turks counterattack and they go and they're killing everybody, right? They're raping all the women. I mean, all the women, like, you know, if you can walk two years old, you're a woman, right? So they're raping. This is that's their practice. And they're throwing the babies in the fire and they're beating people to death and they're burning everything, killing everybody and uh, going typically being. It's what they do, right? So um, the British government was on, like, uh, not wanting to talk about it. Like, we don't see that going on. What, 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 what massacres? What, what massacres? <laughs> the Benjamin Disraeli government didn't seem to notice any killings, but his government was replaced with a more conservative government. And so, uh, and then it, another problem is that Russia was getting very irate. The Russian people were. Kind of like right now with uh, the shoot down of the Russian plane over Turkey, like this huge upsurge of Russian nationalism, this patriotic fervor. Russia is a scary country when all the people march together and get patriotic and get kind of crazy. The Germans found that out in 1941. You know, the Russians, they seem incompetent and they're corrupt and they don't seem to know how to do anything right. And oh, I was saying earlier, the Turks were weak. Another reason the Turks were weak is because they were very corrupt. I mean, that's about all they did was take bribes and give bribes. So, I mean, the, the government was totally corrupt. They had an emperor, a sultan on the throne, and he, these guys couldn't control anything. I mean, they basically, they're an absolute monarch. I am in control. I am the sultan. But in reality, about the only thing they ran was the harem and uh, maybe parties that they would have at the palace because the country was totally corrupt and nobody would listen to anybody and they weren't getting paid and bribed. Okay, so that was another problem with the Turks, internal corruption and, the, and the decay. Okay, so the Russian people just go like berserk in 1877. I mean, there's this patriotic wave all across Russia and it's all in the papers. I mean, um, you know, I know most Russians could not read at the time, but they could talk and tell each other what's happening. And there's just like this rage to attack the Turks. And the Russians were warning the Ottomans. These massacres, they had better stop quick. I mean, this is about to get really dramatic. And it's going to get dramatic to your terrible disfavor. <clears throat> the Turks seemed oblivious to this. It's like they had this this fantasy that Great Britain was going to jump in and help them no matter what kind of atrocities they committed. Finally, the Russians said, that's it. It's over. They just started, they declared war on Turkey and began to invade with massive armies. So you basically have Russia invading and the Bulgarians and the Serbians and everybody else and the Greeks jumping in to help. And it's a big old battle. I mean, the Ottomans, I said, were relatively weak compared to other countries. I didn't say they were absolutely weak. They had armies they could fight. So this big old battles all throughout the Balkans, all throughout Romania and Bulgaria, naval battles, battles in the eastern part of the Black Sea, around what we call Azerbaijan and Georgia today. This is a big old war. This was not some like sideline war. But the Russian armies and their allies began to roll the Turks back. Now, of course, there are going to be atrocities on the other side. These wars are terrible. Uh, and so you're going to have, to, I mean, they're going into Turkish Villa. If you're Muslim and you're left behind, and it's not going to be pretty. And especially these um, Turkish irregular troops, these kind of 
volunteer troops that the Turks would hire to go around killing people, they get caught. They're not going to a prison camp. <laughs> They're getting killed. And then all the Jews started to flee because they knew when the Russians came in, they would kill a Jew as fast as they would kill a Turk. Maybe faster, if you know the history of Russia and the Jews. Okay. So they're all running, right? And the Russian army's pouring down through Romania, through Bulgaria, through Macedonia, through into northern Greece and towards Constantinople. Basically, the Russian goal was to liberate Constantinople after 400 years of Muslim occupation. And they're going to rebuild the Greek empire, a Christian empire, naturally under the guidance of Mother Russia. Well, I bet you can't guess who's going to intervene. Well, of course you can guess. The British began to prepare for war. Why? To protect the Western world against the Muslim hordes? No. To go in and fight Russia to protect Islam, um, the Islamic Turks from being wiped out by the Russians and to keep the Ottoman Empire at least partially intact. This, this made the Russians very angry. They say there's some sort of British conspiracy against Russia. The Russians believe this today, in fact, that there's an Anglo-American conspiracy against Russia. You would know that if you read the Russian newspaper, uh, Pravda, their online uh, paper. All right, they, they always believe that. They believe that always, that there was a, a Western European conspiracy against Russia. Okay, so they're very angry. So right at the point where they're going to bust into Constantinople, they have to stop. I mean, that's the last city in Europe. Then you're in Asia. The Russians are forced to stop, and they say, okay, we're pretty tired from fighting the Turks. We don't want to fight Great Britain. So they signed a treaty with Turkey called San Stefano, Treaty of San Stefano, 1878. And the Turks are going to only be able to keep that little foothold in Europe around Constantinople. They lose the rest of their ter territory. Bulgaria becomes this huge kingdom, independent kingdom, allied with Russia naturally. Romania is completely independent now. Serbia is completely independent. Montenegro, <coughs> Greece gets more territory. And um, Austria Hungary is going to get Bosnia and Herzegovina, an area next to Croatia, which Austria always wanted. And that was kind of a deal Russia made with Austria. Like, if you stay out of this war, um, we'll let you have something. And Austria said, that's cool. We'll do that. So you got to remember, at this time, Russia, Germany, and Austria are cooperating. Makes sense. Should have stayed that way. They have their natural allies. So at this time in 1878, Russia, Germany, and Austria, the Empire of Austria-Hungary, are natural allies, and they're cooperating. I mean, there was, there's no, absolutely no reason for those three countries to ever fight each other. Um, Great Britain throws a fit when they read the terms of San Stefano because Bulgaria is too big. Now, here's Great Britain over there in London. They decide, they decide Bulgaria is too big. So they threaten war again. Oh, no, we're going to have a war. It's very upsetting to Russia. So they have an emergency meeting in Berlin, the Congress of Berlin, with all the great powers, just like the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And they decide that Russia is going to have to back down. So there's the big Treaty of Berlin, 1878. So let's look at what does the Treaty of Berlin, 1878 say? Okay, Turkey will be allowed to regain territories in Europe all the way across to Albania, which is a small country south of Serbia, north of Greece. So Albania, all the way back to Turkey, still under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Greece gets some more territory. Bulgaria shrinks down a lot smaller than it was supposed to be. Part of, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, Bulgaria shrinks down, and then part of Bulgaria, Eastern Romelia, is separated from Bulgaria as a separate principality. Bulgaria will not even be considered independent. They're only going to be considered, by the terms of this agreement, a self-governing principality of the Ottoman Empire, as well as Eastern Romelia. 
the Bulgarians are very irritated by this. I mean, in reality, they're going to be independent because they're going to have their own parliament, their own army, their own flag, their own prince. But they're still going to be considered a Turkish province. Serbia is going to be considered completely independent, as well as Montenegro, the little mountain country, which is independent today. But now we're going to introduce a real problem. Oh, before we get to the real problem, let's look at the island of Cyprus. Cyprus Island, which is 80% Greek, is going to become a British occupied territory. Uh, still technically a Turkish province, but occupied by Great Britain. Where they immediately established naval bases so they can monitor the eastern Mediterranean, protect the Suez Canal in Egypt, which is coming under control of Great Britain by 1878. And interestingly, Great Britain still controls those naval bases today in 2015, December 2015. And no, these are not naval bases that they rent from Cyprus. These are called sovereign base areas, meaning that they are territories of Great Britain. They can, under the terms of the treaty, they can never go to Cyprus unless Great Britain wants to give them up. So they're actual British territories in Cyprus today, two territories. <coughs> By the way, the British uh, <coughs> let Cyprus become independent in 1960, 55 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me, a little allergy problem. All right. So Great Britain really comes out like a champ because they don't do any fighting in 1878, but they get the island of Cyprus and establish naval bases, which they still own today as sovereign British territories. Russia comes out okay. They do damage the Turks. They get a lot of areas east of, east of the uh, Black Sea. But it does make them look bad because Bulgaria does not get complete independence. So it's like Russia has to back down again to Great Britain. Now we're going to go to the real problem. Serbia wanted to have their own empire. Now they had this dream that you know, because they remembered back in the 1300s when Serbia was this kind of Balkan empire. Now they want to have their big Serbian kingdom again, and they want to stretch all the way to the Adriatic Sea, where they can have an outlet to the rest of the world by the sea. But who steps in to block them? Here comes the Habsburgs of Austria and Hungary. The deal stays in place. Austria and Hungary get control of Bosnia and Herzegovina. They don't own them just like with Bulgaria and uh, Cyprus has these little legal situations. They're occupied by Austria and her, uh, uh, Hungary. So they're not considered part of the Austrian empire. They're considered occupied by the Austrian empire. Remember that this is very important. Serbia is furious. I mean, they want to fight Austria. You know, they want to fight Austria to get that land, but they're not about to do that because Serbia is small and Austria will whip them, you know, beat them apart. <clears throat> so Serbia's got to figure out how they can fight Austria and get that land back, you know, that land for their own. But of course, they're going to need help. So that's going to lead us to another story later on. So here we go. We're 1878, and that's the situation. Not exactly a settled deal, but that's the deal in place. There's a map of the Balkans. See? Of course, this map is from uh, 1913, after another war that broke out, which we're going to get to. <clears throat> Bulgaria did annex Eastern Romelia in 1885. The Turks didn't like it, but they weren't able to do much about it because they had a lot of other problems. So the great powers said, oh, well, doesn't matter. They're still under the Turks on paper, at least. There was an uprising in Crete, and there was a number of uprisings in Crete. All right, but in in 1890s, there was a big uprising, and the Turks went in there and did their thing. You know what their thing is. Mass murder of women, children, rape, of course, of everybody, and um, killing everybody. Okay, so there's another threat of war, and the British hurried up and told the Turks to chill out. And, and then so what happened was Crete was occupied 
by the great powers, a joint occupation, still owned by Turkey, but occupied. And then eventually it came under the control of Greece in 1908, and then eventually annexed by Greece in 1913, Crete, that big old cigar-shaped island, the southernmost Greek island, Crete. Okay, so that's what happened to that island. We have to fast forward a little bit to 1911. In 1911, the Kingdom of Italy, I mean, they had missed the boat on colonization around the world because they were too busy with their internal problems, just like Germany. But in 1911, Italy wants to have their overseas empire. But they got to get stuff no one else really wanted. And one of the things they wanted was Libya, right south of Sicily Island, Libya. You know Libya, Tripoli and Cyrenaica. And you know, they always come up with these excuses, but what basically happened, Italy attacked the Ottoman Empire in 1911 and invaded some Greek islands and Libya. And the Turks were well beaten. And Italy did all right. They, they beat the Turks and they were able to conquer Libya and Libya became an Italian province which Italy actually kept until 1951. And they, these Eastern Greek islands, we call them the Dodecanese islands, became Italian territories until 1945 when Italy was forced to give them up because, you know, they lost World War II. But um, so Italy is creating their Mediterranean empire. They've grabbed <coughs> Libya and some Greek islands from the Turks. Now you say, well, so what? It sends a message to the Balkan countries that Turkey is really weak. And I mean, Turkey was really weak. They had had a revolution basically in 1908 where these so-called reformers took over the empire called the Young Turks, and they're going to change everything and clean up the empire. But they didn't really because, you know, they forgot to stop stealing all the money themselves so they turned out to be as about as corrupt as the people they were as the corrupt people they were kicking out but uh so it really caused internal problems in turkey and um so everybody figured this is their opportunity so and and we really need to backtrack before 1911 we go back to 1908 this is really the flashpoint and i should have mentioned that before i'm just doing this without notes right so 1908 this is really where it leads to a really serious crisis in 1908, Bulgaria decides they're just going to declare independence without any consultation to the Congress of Berlin. They just did it. The Prince of Bulgaria says, oh, we're now independent. We're the Kingdom of Bulgaria, and I'm the Tsar, which we could interpret as the King of Bulgaria. Turkey doesn't attack. Well, they couldn't attack. They had all these internal problems that were starting with the Young Turk uprising. So that's really why the Bulgarians did this. Well, you see, under the terms of the Treaty of Berlin, there really wasn't supposed to be any status changes without consultation. So Bulgaria just said, we're independent. No one said a thing about it. The British, the French, I mean, the Turks didn't like it, but they didn't have time to deal with it. No one said a word. So Austria-Hungary says, well, how about that? You can violate the treaty and no one cares. So they took advantage of that and they immediately said, okay, well, fine. We annex Bosnia-Herzegovina. So Austria immediately annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina and said, now it's part of Austria. Now you know who's going to be furious, Serbia. They're in an uproar. Ah, ah, oh, no, 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 no. No, you can't do that. You're violating the treaty. We wanted that territory. And the, Austria says, well, you didn't complain. You didn't seem to mind when Bulgaria did their thing, but now we did it, so it's a problem. But it was too late. No one's going to fight Austria Hungary for that. They just said, well, okay. It's going to lead to this ongoing feud between Serbia and Austria Hungary. And Serbia says, that's it. We're going to get them some kind of way. We're going to get those guys but we can't do it alone, we have no strength. All right, so we, we talked about that, and then we say Italy attacked the Ottomans and they easily beat them, so that sent a message to the Balkan countries that these Turks are garbage and we can beat them. So in 1912, Greece, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, and Bulgaria attacked the Turks. 
those five countries against that one empire, the Turkish Empire, Ottoman Empire. Well, you know what happened. They routed the Turks. They just started invading Albania and 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 Romelia and, and Thessaly, and they just kicked the Turks out of Europe, all the way back to Constantinople. And the Turks, they just, just like with San, San Stefano, they're, they're bottled up in Constantinople. Y'all are finished. But these Bulgarians, they got no sense, right? I mean, these um, Balkan people apparently have no sense. You know, like everybody else in the world, nobody has any sense. Bulgaria grabbed a whole lot of territory during this first Balkan War of 1912. Well, of course, they're going to grab all that territory because that's the territory they wanted to have back in 1878. But what's going to happen when Bulgaria grabs all this land? Well, first of all, Russia says, that's right, that's right, they're supposed to have that land. But Serbia and Romania and Montenegro and Greece, they complain and say, oh, no, 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 you're grabbing too much. And Bulgaria says, hey, we all joined up to beat the Turks. Let us have the land we want. Well, of course, they weren't going to do that. So now a second Balkan War breaks out in 1913, but it's flipped. Now it's Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, and Romania versus the Bulgarians. And now this is a big old war, and they're all fighting each other. And what does Turkey do while they're all fighting? They invade and grab back a lot of land that they had lost, like Adrianople over there in southeastern Europe. So they grab their land back, or a lot of it back. Land that they still own. Land that they still own today, by the way. If you look at a map of Europe, you'll notice that there's a, a corner in southeastern Europe that's still owned by the Turks today. <clears throat> so 1913 ends with all of these countries mad at each other. Everybody's mad at Bulgaria. Russia, they don't know whose side to take in this one because they're supposed to be protecting they're all, all these people. The Serbians mad at Austria-Hungary and saying some kind of way we're going to get this land. And then the Austrians concerned, you know, because, you know, like, oh, man, maybe we shouldn't have annexed this territory. And we got these Serbians to deal with. But the Austrian emperor was very old. Okay, this guy had been on the throne since 1848, Francis Joseph of Habsburg. Imagine this. He had been the emperor since 1848. Here we are in 1913. Well, everybody knows he's not going to be around for too much longer. And his, uh, his, all this, there's a family story when I get into that. His wife was dead. His, his son was dead. They had a lot of family internal problems with murder and everything. Suicide, but, um... The closest person that could inherit the throne was Francis Ferdinand, his nephew, the Archduke, the Prince Royal. He would be the next emperor, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, who had a wife who couldn't even be empress because she wasn't royal enough. That was another controversy. So none of his kids could inherit the throne. So he could be the emperor, but then it would go to his brother. Uh, but uh, anyway, his brother Charles. But anyway, um. Francis Ferdinand, man, he, he really was worried about a war breaking out in Europe because he knew if a war breaks out in Europe, Austria is not going to win it and they're going to lose everything they own. And Austria is going to be a little old country called Austria and all their territories are going to be gone. I mean, he pretty much knew this. Well, how did they make the Hungarians happy? They let them have internal self-government and be the kingdom of Hungary with their own flag and parliament and have self-government. And that made them happy. So his plan was to make a tripartite empire. He wanted to make an empire called the Empire of Austria, Hungary, and Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, Slavia. And he would be the emperor of Austria, the king of Hungary, and the king of Yugoslavia. And then they could rule themselves, the, the Slavic people could rule themselves, have their own parliament, their own flag, and they would be united in some ways with the empire. Just like Hungary. Good idea. Well, guess what country was no kind of way going to go along with that idea? You got it. Uh, uh, Serbia. Now, if this man, Francis Ferdinand, is able to create Yugoslavia under the guidance of Austria and bring peace to southeastern Europe, Austria is uh, Serbia is never going to get Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
So they start plot. We're going to knock this guy out. And there was a secret organization of Serbians called the Black Hand basically what we would call a terrorist organization, which had connections to the Serbian government. Can I say right here that the Serbian king knew of this? I cannot say that. Did elements of the Serbian government know about this? Uh, only a fool would think that that was not the case. With all the evidence available? Well, um, <clears throat> Francis Ferdinand decided he was going to make a trip to Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was part of Austria at the time. And um, actually, some of the Yugoslavians liked the, the Habsburgs. The Croatians did because they were Catholic, like the Austrians. So they were, they t and the Slovenians as well. They tended to be favorable, t favorable towards Austria. The Muslims that were under the control of Austria tended to be favorable towards Austria because they didn't like Serbs. Serbs had a tendency to kill Muslims. So it was the Serbians didn't like them. All right. So there was some warnings to um, Francis Ferdinand. Don't go to Sarajevo. There's a terrorist. This, we know about the, the Austrian intelligence service, and we know about these terrorists, you could be killed. No, no, I think it'll be okay. We have a, we have a pretty decent security service. Uh, actually, they did not really have a pretty good security service. But he went, he and his wife went down there to Sarajevo to meet with their leaders and try to work out this project he was working on, this Yugoslavia project, to prevent a war now. Well, you know what happened. The gang was waiting. The Serbian gang, these young men, teenagers, early 20s, was waiting. And they're going to kill him. And there was a big complicated story, which I'm not going into. And the whole plot failed, basically. But there was a situation with the driver going through Sarajevo and not knowing the city too well and going this way and getting lost and going down a one-way street and having to back up. And this just so happens that when he was... They were basically out of trouble. They backed up and they stopped. And where they stopped was right where the last assassin happened to be waiting, Gabrilo Princip. 17 years old, some books say 18, young, had a pistol. He st stood up on the, 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 um, the uh, what you call it, the um, running board of the car and uh, convertible, you know, these Presidents and world leaders like to ride in convertibles when they're being threatened for some reason. Don't go to that city. There could be assassins waiting. I'm going to go there and ride in a convertible. Stood up in the car and shot. Bam, 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 bam. Into the car. Shooting the woman through the chest. Blood spurting out. The Archduke said, Sophia, don't die for the children. Then he passes out. And they're murdered. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen now. This is going to be an alarm across Europe. They said the Kaiser was in his uh, in the Baltic Sea in his summer boat, and they sent him the message, and he read it. Archduke Francis Ferdinand murdered in Sarajevo along with wife Sophia. Said his all the color drained out of his face. He was in shock because he knew this is bad. This is very bad. You can imagine Austria-Hungary's reaction. I mean. You know, people say, oh, they overreacted because the man was c killed and they tried to make a war on Serbia and all this. <laughs> We're not going to get into World War I today. Okay, you could say all that. Imagine if the president of the United States and his wife were murdered in a city. You think people would say, well, well you know, these things happen. You know, people would go crazy. Um, like in 1963. If it had been known that a foreign country had done it, you can imagine there's going to be war guaranteed. There's going to be a war. Unless the country was connected to the Soviet Union and you're worried about blowing the world up in World War III or whatever. you know. But um, once the man was shot and his wife was shot and murdered, the Austrian government says that's it. That is it. I mean, it's um, you know like in The Godfather. Now we go into the mattresses. And you know, if this happens, somebody's getting clipped. And so Austria decides, okay, we're going to take care of the Serbian problem right now. But that's where the story is going to stop because that's going to lead to a much bigger story. But you can see the chain reactions by watching these four videos. One thing, and then it leads to these 50 other things. 
So it's very interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you, but it's interesting to me. Thank you for watching this video production.